that's what people take when they walk away from the table. How did I feel? Right. And and if they like felt awful because they felt like they could never have, have won, like it was just completely out of their hands, they don't want to repeat that experience, right? right. Whereas like right. a hardcore gamer is like, that's a challenge. <laughs> I will come back and like conquer this. Whereas, you know, someone a little less intense is just like, yeah, I'd rather play something that made me feel better. Right. to Cardboard Creations, where we discuss the process, techniques, and inspiration for designing board games. I'm your host, Candice Harris, and I'm super excited to be here today with Roberta Taylor to find out how Creature Comforts was created. But first, let's jump into a brief overview of how Creature Comforts works. Creature Comforts is a cozy, family-friendly strategy game for one to five players, where each player represents a family preparing their home to be nice and cozy for winter. In the spring, summer, and fall, you'll send family members out to various locations on the board with a unique simultaneous worker placement system. After placing your family members in turn order, you'll allocate public and private dice to action spaces where your family members were placed to gather different goods from the forest and spend them to collect items that will make your home more inviting while the world outside is covered in a layer of snow. The family that has created the most comfortable den by winter wins the game. Hi, Roberta. How's it going today? Welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Lincoln and Nikki played Creature Comforts on game night. And ever since they played it, they would tell me about it and say how much they liked it and everything. And I'm pretty sure they both had it on their top 10 of 2022, like top 10 games of 2022 list. So I just kept being kind of intrigued by this game. And after I finally checked it out, I was really impressed with how it has this cutesy and cozy feel to it, but like a lot of really interesting mechanisms. And yeah, and it just like, it's, it's a meatier game than it appears to be, which I find like really interesting. So I gotta know, like what initially inspired you to create Creature Comforts? Um, so Creature Comforts was one of those games that spent a long time incubating. Um, it started its life as a different game. Um, at the time, uh, I was living on the coast of Northwest BC in a tiny Indigenous community of like 300 people, two hours from the nearest store. Um, and what really stuck out about that experience was just people there were still living very seasonally. Um, you know, there's things you just did because the weather was right and it's spring and now you have to do it or you miss your chance. And and a lot more of that than, of course, you're used to if you're living in a city, kind of an office job. And I, I really wanted that feeling of the seasons in a board game. And so it started there. And of course, I don't know how other designers work, but I sort of flail around for a long time, like trying different <laughs> things. And, oh, oh, that sounded good in my head, but it doesn't work. Um, and the game I came out with at the end of sort of the initial design process um, got a lot of really great feedback, but I sort of realized like I had leaned into sort of the indigenous aspect more than I, than I really could take it with, because as much as we lived in that community and were a part of it, it wasn't my story. So I, I revisited it with like, okay, the seasons and all that, like that's that's something I love. Where can I take this story that that makes more sense um, for me to tell and, and it'll appeal to folks. And at the same time, I had been reading some really great essays about cozy video games. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, this is my thing. Like, these are the games I want to play this is awesome. exactly the aesthetic I want. And um, so I took what I learned from that and smooshed it all together. And that was Creature Comforts. Um, wow, that's super yeah. cool. So how did you get from, well, the, like, that cozy video games thing is kind of fascinating too. But like, how did you get from that initial idea into a playable prototype of Creature Comforts? So lots of lots of starts and stops. I initially had this bright idea that this would have movement on a map, which of course it doesn't, and it, it doesn't need. Um, 
And that's actually, um, I think that's one of those things that, that can be hard to do well. And this definitely wasn't the context for it. So I abandoned that, but I had this sort of idea of, well, you know, there's all these things you could do in this valley that you plan to do um, because, you know, you can go and, and you could gather berries or whatever, but you're a little constrained by like, what, what if there's um, a really late frost and you can't get out to gather those berries or like, what if it pours rain for a week? Um, and so how can I represent that? And that's where the dice, that shared dice mechanic is really in my head. Those are, those are things beyond your control. Mm. As much as you plan and you know, well, mushrooms should be ready now. Maybe it doesn't work out because sure. of the elements or whatever. And so that's, that was kind of, of where that came together. And when I prototype, I mean, it's evolved a lot over the years, but I, I generally grip a big piece of paper and draw out my board. Um, I don't like digital boards. They break my brain. <laughs> the scale <laughs> just doesn't work for me. I end up like, this thing is the wrong size. <laughs> you start, of course, with whatever you can find and, and build up to something a little bit better. But um, when, I was, when I was putting this sort of cozy into it, I had a lot of fun um, completely unnecessarily sketching little critters to go on my prototype cards and stuff because, <laughs> you know, do this because you love it, right? So right. I don't lead into the parts that are fun um, awesome. as, as well. And so, yeah, and and I, I did a lot of um, playing with different, how different things might work as far as like, oh, well, Initially, I had like this river you could go fishing and then you'd sort of a little more push your luck. Um, that's changed a little bit with the, the nice tumbling disc that actually that was a Josh Capel innovation to make that space move every time oh, where gotcha. um, your dice, you know, we really wanted. So back that up a bit with one of the concepts of a cozy game is there's abundance and we don't take things away from players. Mm. And, and And of course, when you have dice involved, um, one thing like Stone Age is kind of your classic game everyone's familiar with, but mathematically in Stone Age, sixes are still better right. because they're still more powerful. And I didn't want that. I wanted, you have to work with the luck, but if you just roll ones, you can still have a phenomenal game. Cool. And so having that little river dial rotate so that sometimes ones are the best and sometimes ones are less good mm -hmm or whatever, um, really just fit into that, that sort of feel of the whole thing we were going to. So. Cool. Cool. And so did you like from the start kind of always have like the visitors are going to come and, um, the, you know, you have so many awesome comfort cards, like they are, they are so cozy feeling like I'm like, Oh, a quilt. I, I would love to like take this quilt, but <laughs> Or do I take the socks? I don't know. Or the soup, you know? At what point did you kind of start integrating all those different cards and uh, other components? And like, did it start with uh, the dice mechanism or did you like start doing cards first and then later got to that core like dice mechanism? Um, so the, the cards that were the comforts and the dice were part of the game from the basically very, very early on. Okay. You're, you're putting, you're building things, you're putting together things by gathering the resources to create these, these items. Um, the, the travelers that come to the inn, the visitors, those I added in when I started um, thinking about the specifics of the Maple Valley setting and what's here. And I'm like, that's so cool. You can go down and they're going to tell you stories and they all, some, maybe some guy has a bag full of stuff he sells, like who knows. Right. And, and in a small community, like visitors are, um, so much excitement. Like when we first moved to that little teeny community, we would be out for a walk and, and, you know, people drive by in their car, they'd be walking and they'd stop us and they want to know who we are and, and what we did <laughs> because, you know, every person it, it, you know them and and right. so i thought like i love that idea of oh who's visiting right now and so yeah. that was really fun to add in um but that yeah the dice and and that you're you're using those dice to collect things to build the cards like that was definitely the starting point cool cool so how much play testing was done and can you talk about your play testing process a little bit yeah so i mean over the years lots and lots of, of, of play testing um 
you know, with whoever I could. And when I started working on the game, I lived really remotely. Um, and so it was just my family, my, my long suffering children. And <laughs> it's like whoever would sit down and play, you know, family mm-hmm. when they would visit or whatever. Um, and then I moved to Edmonton where I am now, which is a much bigger center. And so it was a lot easier to, to connect with other game designers and, um, connect with, um, there's a really strong community here in Alberta of game designers. Um, Roxley Games is in Calgary, which isn't super far away. Um, and so, again, a chance to get in front of other folks like that. Um, cool. And for me, the, the the sort of the process with playtesting really is um, once the game is fully playable, like we're, we're, you know, we're not talking that early fits and starts where you're just like solo testing it or you play half a game, like once you're at a more stable point is, is basically playing it with people or watching them play it. And, and as much watching their reactions and their decisions and where they're, where they look confused as anything. And then of course, at the end, sort of that little debrief, write everything down rather than like debate it at the table, of course. And I do, I have my favorite question is, did you want to do something I wouldn't let you or the game wouldn't let you? Um, Mm. Because, you know, it, I might hear from every single player, I wanted to trade with other players. I can still say no, that doesn't belong in this game. But it tells me I need to think about it seriously, about if it doesn't belong, why not? Or you know what right, I mean? And right, so for me, sure. I find that that's one of my favorite things to ask folks. But Cool, yeah. cool. At what point did you start documenting rules for Creature Comforts? So I start game design almost immediately with the rule document. Um, and I know like people vary hugely on that. I have a horrible memory. If I don't have a rules <laughs> document, I don't actually know how to play the game. Like it's awful. <laughs> and, and so I, I found for me that also forces me, you know, I have like a template and it forces me to consider all the different parts from the beginning. I tend to write a vision document when I start a new design of who's going to play this, what experience do I want? Um, You know, are there any component constraints? You know, what story am I telling? And I can make sure when I'm doing that first brush over the rules that I'm heading in those directions that I set up myself. Um, And it it just, for me, really orders my thoughts. Um, I'm in awe of people who can pull a game off the shelf and remember how to play it three months later. Like... (laughs) Yeah, I come from an IT background where I was a business systems analyst. So I was like the person between the end user and then the developer. So it was like, I understand that like where I'm writing requirements and saying, this is how it should work. This is what we're trying to accomplish. And then the developer makes it, you know. So I totally get that perspective of starting with the rules to kind of define what you want to do and what you're trying to accomplish and everything. And that's, that's really cool that you do kind of a vision board because um, that's important to think about, like, who is the audience for the game and, and what, are you, what story are you trying to tell? Mm-hmm. Um, I, is it, I, I think that, that some designers, especially new designers, easily forget that there is no game that is for everyone. Mm. You cannot make that game. So right. the sooner you're clear on your vision the easier time it is, especially when you start playtesting with other people, because they might have a brilliant idea, but Mm -hmm. if it doesn't take you towards your goal, it makes it way easier to say that's awesome and not try to incorporate it. Right, (laughs) Or save it for another game, right? (laughs) Totally, totally. So what was, what would you say was your like biggest challenge when you were designing and developing Creature Comforts? To give some context, this game was designed over 10 years. The biggest challenge was in that time, that was from like, it was one of the first games I started working on. And, and, you know, up until it finally got published and I grew a lot as a designer in there. And I think that, I think that was part of the challenge was just waiting until I had the skills to do the idea justice. Um, Mm. And I'm really comfortable putting something on the shelf until I have time to come back to it. And I mean, some of those 10 years were spent working on it a lot. And some of those 10 years were spent moving provinces and starting a new career and, you know, dealing with my kids growing up and leaving home. Like there's life in there too. It's not (laughs) like 10 years of development. Um, But I I think it really was just 
a time of, of, of sharpening my skills until I could make the game that I, that I wanted to. Ah, ah, very cool. Did you have any aha moments when you were designing it? The truth there is no, it's a lot of hard work and, and bits and pieces. And when I look at like bits of the design that actually really, really shine, mm -hmm. it's often actually because I had something that was, that was good. And then when Josh Capel from KTBG did his magic with his development, uh -huh. he like saw what I was trying to do and just elevated it this tiny bit until it just sh sh shined. Awesome. Was shiny. Like, yeah. he's so good at that. And, and it was such a, a, a fun thing to see, like, because when, when you're working with someone who really understands what you're trying to do with it. And, mm. and I think that this sort of coming back and seeing he, where he was like, you're trying to do this. So I thought this would work. It was like, oh my goodness. Like, <laughs> I just learned so much from that process. So I think that was like where the ahas came in as much as anything. I think up until that point, it was just a lot of, That's awesome. of coming back and trying little things and seeing sure. you know, what worked. Cool. I mean, I think it's undeniable that the artwork is like so lovely and everything about it just like oozes that like cozy feel that you you were going for. Uh, so how were the art and graphic design decisions made? I had my prototype and I had done my little drawings to try to make it look cute. And it's like, here's my vision. And Josh and Helena 125% like saw that vision. And, and they spent quite a bit of time looking for the right artist. And when they settled on Shauna, then she understood the, the um, assignment completely. Mm -hmm. And it, it really was, I had complete hands off. I just kept getting texts every so often of, oh, look at the raccoon. I'm like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> and, that's you know, awesome. Like, just, oh, it, it was a awesome. really, really such a gift to be able to just not even feel like like I completely could trust them because everything that, that they did was like, yeah, like I imagine that, but you made it even better. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Uh, so when and how did you come up with the name Creature Comforts? <laughs> so so we have a joke. Roberta's not allowed to name board games. Um, <laughs> I, I've actually started not even basically naming prototypes because I'm really bad at it. <laughs> And so it didn't really have a name and it took Helena a couple months, I think, uh, more than a couple months, quite okay. a while. Okay. And then it was like, because I showed it to them at the gathering in April and it was, I think it was in July, I get this text, what about Creature Comfort? So I'm like, I hear a good name. I know I get a name when I yeah. hear it. In a million years, I wouldn't have come up with that, but I love it so much. It's so good. I mean, the alliteration is great. It it tells you know what it's kind of about, what you're going to experience. Um, that's that's cool. Yeah, I'm always just fascinated to hear like how people come up with the uh, title for board games. Yeah, I, I just need to have like a, a disclaimer on my on my portfolio <laughs> page. Like, don't ever ask me to name your game because. <laughs> It will just be complete, just a description of what's going on. <laughs> That's great. What one day I want to see the whole list of all the like terrible game names you've come up with. <laughs> make it make a game out of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So so when did you know uh, the game was finished and um, ready to be produced? I think it was a Kickstarter, right? Yeah, yeah. So they did Kickstarter. So that. I mean, so here's the thing with Creature Comforts. I had actually, like, I knew Helena through the Game Artists of Canada, um, which is like a little informal game design group here. And I had, I knew she'd be at the gathering and I had said, hey, like, when we're there, can you sit down and play this game? Because I, I just need you to tell me, like, should I finish it or like give up? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I'm too close to this. I've been mm. too close to it too, too long. And I don't have any sense. And, and I really trust your opinion and she sat down and played it was like um when can I have it awesome and basically took it and they started development fairly directly um and so I guess it was done then and then their team added more comforts added more visitors to the inn um I had originally made them all bears I don't know why <laughs> it's way cooler when they're all different animals <laughs> um That's but funny. you know it sort of just made more depth of content um, 
and and they knew kind of of course how many cards they wanted and and how um how much would would fit their they're the business smart people <laughs> um and and all of that so cool. you know i i think that the those in the final call of like when is this ready to push trigger on that was all them cool cool uh do you have any advice for anyone out there who you know, might be trying to design kind of a family friendly or even a, like a cozy board game since that seems to be something you're kind of passionate about. I've seen a lot of conversation about family games and cozy games, of course, and I'm very interested, like you say, in, in something that that um, came up recently actually in um, in person and again on Twitter was this idea that, that um, people who've only sort of played like mass market games are more comfortable with like take that and stuff like that. And I maintain that maybe they're more used to it because a lot of those games do it, but a lot of people are looking for a gentle experience. Mm. And, and so there's this idea that, uh, for example, a worker placement has to be really tight competitive. I'm not sure that's always true. I actually believe that if you lean into abundance in a game, that creates different decisions. It doesn't take them away. And I right. think if you're looking like family friendly, you know, even if you're not winning, if you feel like you're doing good because you have built this cool thing or you have these cool things, um, I think that that helps. And so I think considering the emotional resonance of the types of decisions you're asking people to make is going to be really important when you consider if your audience are, you know, if you're playing with children and parents, like, and also, how are you going to mitigate skill versus luck so that the kids have a chance of competing with their parents? Because, um, you know, it doesn't take a lot to, to even that playing field a little bit without making it a complete luck fest. And so right. I, I think really thinking about those things. And it's not that you can't have meaningful decisions and strategic depth and all of that. Um, but it's it's just really considering how you're doing that and... Um, and also, like, if you're looking at, like, families who game, mm -hmm. kids can be pretty sophisticated if you expect that their parents are going to learn the rules and teach it and play it with them. Um, you know, you don't have to have a billion fiddly rules, but they can actually figure out a lot. Like, when we play Creature Comforts at home, um, the 11-year-old wins all the time. Like, she is awesome. capable of figuring this out and, and making her plans and doing the thing. And so cool. you don't have to, like, dumb it down. Like, if you're looking at, like, more, you know, mass market or kids playing it on their own, that's a whole other conversation. But as far as, like, family-friendly, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that there's, there's definitely – you don't want this great big heavy slug, but it's mostly, for me, about that emotional – how are people feeling when they're playing this? Because that's what people take when they walk away from the table. How did I feel? Right. And and if they like felt awful because they felt like they could never have, have won, like it was just completely out of their hands, they don't want to repeat that experience, right? right. Whereas like right. a hardcore gamer is like, that's a challenge. <laughs> I will come back and like conquer this. Whereas, you know, someone a little less intense is just like, yeah, I'd rather play something that made me feel better. Right, right. So true, so true. Well, Roberta, thank you so much for joining me today on Cardboard Creations. Like, it was really, really awesome to, you know, hear the backstory and your inspiration for creating creature comforts. I know there's, you have Maple Valley, and which is like kind of a follow-up or a game in the same world as Creature Comforts. Um, but is there anything else like coming down the pike in this world or for Creature Comforts or just anything else you're working on that you'd like to share? Yeah, so as far as the Maple Valley Creature Comforts world, I'm not sure if if there'll be more in that vein or not. Um, I am working with KTBG on a new game, but we're not sure exactly where we're going to put it. Okay. Um, and I just, um, an, a, a recently announced project I'm super excited about is I got to design a um, game for Maestro Media about Hello Kitty. Um, oh! that is going to be kickstarting in September and awesome. that was a super fun project and I'm really excited for people to uh, awesome. get to play that game because, um, yeah, I got to kind of try to do that little bit of a bridge of, of, it's not as simple as, um, a play straight mass market game, but it's got that feel. So hopefully it hits cool. there. Cool. 
And yeah, a few more things I've done that aren't announced yet. So, you know, keep watching, but I don't, yeah, I don't have details on anything else at the moment. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to checking them all out. That sounds really great. Uh, so yeah, thank you again for joining me. Uh, and it was lovely to talk to you. Yes, likewise. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for watching Cardboard Creations. Hopefully it's been as inspiring and fascinating for you as it has been for me. And remember, the only way to get something done is to start doing it. Boom.